get back into now the normal curve. Okay. Uh, so one of the things that I did, and I didn't totally explain the methods because it was proprietary information. So one of the cool things about the, I think it's in Super Freakonomics, they talk about how they caught several um, would-be terrorists uh, in London, and they're like, well, we can't really tell you how we did that because they're still using that algorithm, but we can tell you some of the things. Um, so one of the things is they're not likely to buy life insurance. So suicide bombers don't really buy life insurance for obvious reasons. Um, <clears throat> but what they're using to determine the cheating patterns is part of the normal distribution and z-scores. So sometimes this is called the bell curve. What was the original name for it? So I have a couple of the names of the famous people who worked on this. It's Moira, Bernoulli, Morgan. Um, names you don't have to know because they're hard to spell. Um, Bernoulli actually has a distribution named after him as about binomial probabilities. But it's still bell curve. So trying to understand this single unimodal distribution that's symmetric. Uh, so these were some of the original sketches of the normal distribution. Uh, it's called the bell curve because it looks like a bell. Unfortunately, in the 70s, I want to say, the bell curve book was published, which is about IQ differences across ethnicity and race. And it's an example of the horrible use of statistics because they basically claimed that other people who were not white were genetically inferior, which is a little problematic. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so the bell curve really is meant to talk about the distribution, but it's also in the name of a book about IQ testing. So now we tend to draw the unimodal distribution like this. So we call it the normal curve, which always makes me laugh because it's like the least likely thing you're going to get. So it's actually not too normal. And just a reminder from previous lectures, it is unimodal and symmetric, okay, which is very important okay, that it, you have one hump and it be symmetric. Okay. <clears throat> so as we are sampling, that's what we covered last time, you'll see what happened with the normal curve. So if I took five people, this is a histogram, so I'm measuring people's heights and in inches, and this is frequency, so back to histograms. If I take five people, I get, eh, I don't know that I call that normal, right? Eh, sort of. It is unimodal. <coughs> but more than likely, with five people, you're going to get something that's um, almost square, right? Rectangular. Uniform. <coughs> As I add more people, so let's say we sample 30 instead, it's going to be more normal. So you'll see the heights will start to pile up in the middle, um, and then you'll have less people on the tail. And then if I took even more people, it's even more normal. Um, so the moral of the story is the bigger the sample, you know, this all semester, the better one. Um, but the more normal it's going to be. Um, and that's part of the central limit theorem. So if you've had a, a real math class, they might have talked about this. So the central limit theorem is this idea that as we get more people, the distribution gets more normal. <coughs> find a way. So more people, bigger n. Remember n is the uh, letter for sample size. The more normal it becomes. And so what variables might be normally distributed? Okay. So definitely IQ. We force IQ to have a normal distribution. So they standardize that test to make it normal. So it's easy to talk about. Uh, any standardized test. So you see the trend here. So standardized things tend to be normal. Okay. Handedness is not really normal, because right? that's a, a categorical variable. I right? can't really have that sort of distribution. So when we're talking about normal distributions, we're talking about ratio data or scale data, so interval and ratio. Um, you can't really rank or um, do this with categorical variables. Because okay. <clears throat> gender is a uniform distribution. Slight bias towards women right now, in the U.S. anyway. So we're going to really talk about scale variables most of the rest of the semester. All right. So we don't really totally have this problem anymore, but it's a good example. So we're uh, investigating master students right now. We're talking about who we're going to accept into our program. And we used to, for a couple of years, had this problem where we had students who had the old GRE that was on an 800-point scale, 
and people who had the new GRE on 170 point scale. And so uh, it's kind of hard to compare those two because they're on very different scales. Um, now not so much, mostly people that haven't taken the old one anymore. So the solution is to uh, standardize, which allows us to compare creating a common distribution or generally it puts them all on the same scale. Um, you see this at the university level, so most of the people here take the ACT. I find it very unusual because in Texas it was all about the SAT. Um, but they allow other scales, so they standardize everything back into percentile rank. So on your, um, on the pages that we can see of your test scores, it shows me the score, but then it shows me the percentile rank. So it's a little easier to use. Um, I also do that with high school rank because different high schools use different GPA scales. So standardization happens, you're just not kind of realizing that's going on. So we're going to create percentiles. Percentiles are p-values. So the whole talk about probability last time is leading into um, calculating probabilities. Okay, but calculating probabilities using a known distribution, which allows us to do the objective one. So that long range, or long, the one where you count a bunch of times, uh, not the subjective one. <laughs> so I have slides for each one of these. Okay. So it's called the normal curve because it's standardized. We're going to do a broad Z distribution and talk about its properties. Talk about how to calculate Z scores and compare them. And then a lot about percentiles. But think about percentiles not as like um, the special percent thing we're doing. They are p-values. So keep in mind this is all about p. Okay. So we'll talk about a couple different ways to think about probability. Okay. Yeah. All right. So the z distribution. I draw a zillion z semester. I'm still no good at it, but let's try. <laughs> is the normal distribution of standardized scores, also called the standard normal distribution, also called the bell curve. It's also unimetric. Uh, unimetric. I'm just going to combine words. Unimodal and symmetric, so many names. This is one problem statistics has, is that it's been approached from three or four different perspectives. So the social sciences, the more traditional hard sciences, and math. So there are lots of names for the same thing. What is Z? If it's unimodal, that means the mean, median, and mode are all the same. I mean, if it's symmetric, sorry. Sorry, you can have a skewed unimodal distribution. That's not true. Okay, so if it's symmetric, the mean, median, and the mode are the same. That makes life very easy. Because then we can talk about them not totally interchangeably. But we can say, all right, well, since it's symmetric, we're going to use the mean. That also means that it's perfectly foldable. So 50% of the data is over here, 50% of the data is over here. Quite obviously, all of this together is 100%. Um, and the way that, when we get into p-values here in a minute, it's calculated, it starts from the left and works its way over here. And the p-values are normally in proportions, but you can think about it either way. So this is the zeroth percentile. These are the people with the lowest scores. The mean is the people with the middle score, the 50th percentile. So we also did an interquartile range, right? It would be 0, 25, 50, 75, 100. Um, we'll talk about standard deviations some more in a minute. Uh, people who are up here are in the 100th percentile. So if they're asking for percentile, they just want your p-value in percents. If they're asking for um, p-values, they're normally proportions. Those are the same thing, just times 100. So we're talking about percentile, we're talking about like where people fall along this line. So most of you are up here, right, in the top percentile, so these are the top scores. So this is low, that's a W. <clears throat> All right. So that was a little bit on Z. 
We need a lot more of this. But what is a z-score? So this is the z-distribution. Right. What is a z-score? Uh, so the z-formula is this little thing over here. But uh, what happens is we take each person's original score. So I'm going to erase this real quick and draw it in a slightly different way. Maybe. Here we go. Talk very specifically about my GRE example. So here's the old GRE. Here's the new GRE. So the old GRE had an average score of 500. So the mean was 500, right here in the middle. The lowest you could get, I think, was 200 for showing up and breathing. Okay. The highest you could get was 800. <coughs> and most graduate schools said you got to hit at least a mean. So you had to get at least a 500. The new GRE, is it 120 or 130? No, whatever. Um, the lowest you can get is 130 to 150 to 170. Why the change? I don't know. Wish they had made it symmetric. You just divide it by 100 or something? Like, why? Why don't you just start at zero? But I don't get paid to help them, so. Um, otherwise, I would have been like, you know, it would make a lot more sense if you just did everything in percentiles and just dropped this whole score thing. That would be brilliant. But that's going to be another. So what we do is we take each person's original score, so that's x. So x is their original score. So if I'm here on 500, it will be a 500. We're going to subtract the mean. So this little mu symbol, this is mu, is the population mean. You don't calculate that. You just have to know it. So remember, anytime you have a Greek symbol, it's something they have to give to you. You don't calculate it. So the population mean for the old GRE was 500. The new GRE is 150. So right here in the middle. That's why I lined them up. So 500 on the old test is 150 on the new test. We're going to divide by the population standard deviation. So this is sigma. It's population standard deviation. Don't have to calculate that. It's just given to you. Oh, do I remember the new one? Is it five points or ten points? I think it's five points. Yeah, we'll make it up. The old one, it was 100 points. We'll say the new one is 5 points. That makes sense. Um, these are like the the, nor the kind of normal ones. Every year, the GRE like standardizes based on who's taken the test recently. So they change a little bit. But uh, it's just a good example of transforming from one to another. So for each of these scores, what I can do is transform them to Z. So if I take 500 minus 500 divided by 100 is 0. Yes, we can all agree on this. Yeah. Okay. So our new Z score is 0. Same thing here. 150 minus 150 divided by 5 is 0. That puts 0 right in the middle. Very handy to have the middle be 0. Now. Anybody who is above the mean is going to be positive. So let's do one standard deviation. So let's say this is a 600. So 600 minus 500 divided by 100 is 1. I'll just write 1 here. That makes two standard deviations 700. Negative 1 would be 400. Negative 2. 300. Math is hard. This would be 155 for 1, 160 for 2. So 
So anyone who scores above the mean is positive, anyone who scores below the mean is negative. So it's really handy to have the mean be zero, because if you tell me you got a positive score, I immediately know, okay, you're higher than 50% of the people. You got a negative score, 50% of the people are doing better than you. So they can be positive or negative. And now we can equate the two. So if I have a student come in and tell me their new GRE score is a 145, and I can, I can translate it back and say, ooh, that's below the mean, that's not good. And also, it's an old score of 400. So that allows us to take this scale and this scale and make them the same. <coughs> so when we convert everything to Z, we made it standardized. I think I have this on here. Yeah. So the mean is always zero. This is on the next slide, I think. And the standard deviation of the z-score, not of the population, so standard devi deviation of the normal distribution is one. That makes the numbers really easy to work with. I have that on here. This is a ton of questions. These are very easy multiple choice questions. So what you have to keep separate, though, is that the mean of the distribution is zero, and the, mean, the standard deviation of the distribution is one. Right? But the mean and the standard deviation of the original scale was something else. Okay? So we're going from original scale to z. And this is always true of z. But the mean and standard deviation of the original scale are given to you. So by doing that, um, before I get there, by doing, creating these chunks, what we've done is essentially broken the distribution into little sections, and we can figure out what percent is in each section. So what I've got on here is just a list of all the things we're going to do today and Friday. Um, and so these are the things that you need to make sure that you can do by the time that we're done with this section. Uh, and I have the number of each example on the bottom of the slide, so which one it goes with. Because uh, this is not n like 90% of this next test. All right, so the first one is find a z-score. <coughs> Man, this is easy math. But remember, math like with that, we need to point these here. So if you're doing this on your calculator, you can do this in R, you just type it in. Um, this is pretty easy stuff. So most people do it on their phone. Uh, but don't forget, you have to do the subtraction first. If you just type it all in as one big thing, it'll do um, mu divided by sigma first, because R does know. Please excuse me, dear Aunt Sally. So if you don't put in those parentheses, it will give you the wrong number. <coughs> um, but this is very easy. So you subtract the mean of the population from the raw score, or the original score, and you divide. So let's say I have a student who's come in and they told me that their new score is a 162. I usually have a moment because we don't tend to get scores that high because those are very good. So I would take the mean of the original distribution and divide by sigma. So of course I didn't make that easy. 12 divided by 5 is 1 point something. None of you are going to help me out. No, 2.4. So their z score would be 2.4. That's really high. That's two standard deviations away from the mean and some change. Um, when we did standard deviations, remember the definition for standard deviation was that it's the average distance away from the mean. So they are two average distances away. That's a lot. Z scores over two are really big. So if you're ever doing this, ex doing these examples, and it's not something that I made up on the fly, because I'm bad at making them up, um, generally it needs to be below three. So if you get like eight or nine, it does look that wrong. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. So to go backwards, so if I instead have a student say, well, I need a Z score of at least one and a half. What score do I have to get on the original scale? And you'll see this, people do this for competitions. So um, I think at P, 
here we have an ACT. Is it 30 or 32 for the scholarship interviews? 30. 30? I can't remember. Mm -hmm. um, but the way they did that, they came up with that 30 number was they figured out a percentile. So we want this percentile in ACT to automatically offer you a scholarship and let you compete for the other scholarships. And so they took that percentile and worked backwards. Okay, so that's why the weird, like, it's, it seems like kind of random, like 30. Well, they had a number in mind. Right, so if they wanted a 1.5 on, let's say, the new scale, what I'd do is take 1.5 times sigma plus the mean. That is just this formula rearranged. I'm really bad at calculators. 157 and a half would be their raw score. Now, if I look at my our distribution here, it's at 150 is 0, 155 is 1, and 160 is 2, 170, 57 and a half makes sense. So it's right between 1 and 2. So far, everybody's okay. This is simple math. Um, there's only going to be a little bit of math this semester, and it's mostly in this section that you have to do by hand yourself. <coughs> All right. So another thing that people tend to do is compare scores. Um, this is what I'm trying to do with my GRE score. So I have the old one, I have the new one. Can I make them and compare them? So we would convert both of them to Z and figure out who did better. Um, so this is where I can compare two sets of scores. So if I had my, um, somebody make, let's say, 600, so I already know that's one, compared to my 157, the 157 did better because their z-score was one and a half. So at 157, they're here, and at 600, they're only here. Um, where most people get stuck in this is actually really pretty simple, I think. It just, just seems like it shouldn't be that easy. I think that's the problem people have. Let's convert both of them to Z. Who did better is who has the bigger score. Right, so whose score is larger? Who did worse? Their score is lower. So you can just directly compare them. No magic involved. So if I have a 2 and you have a 1.5, I did better. Okay. <coughs> All right. And the whole point of up to this point is comparing apples and oranges. I know it's a really terribly cheesy phrase. Well, we've used it before, talking about why you use standard deviation. Well, because it's standardized. It helps go back to the original scale. Why use um, z-scores? Because those are really standardized. We've eliminated the scale at this point. So we use standard deviation because it's least in the original scale. We use z-scores to eliminate scale. So I can compare this scale to that scale to this scale. It's also really popular for... Um, Different IQ scales, so there are m several. The Tony, the Waste, Whisk is the kids' version, Stanford Binet, um, and they convert everything back into IQ scores. The raw scores on those scales don't match at all. <coughs> all right. So, do we have time? Yeah. <coughs> so, getting this into, Z, into P, so P values. A Z score tells you where it is on the distribution. So we've kind of drawn this out and I said, okay, 157 is here, it's one and a half. But there are rules about how that turns into a percent. Just give myself some more room here. So we've got Z. Gonna skip negative one. There we go. And we have been talking about okay, this is 150, this is 155, 160, 45, 140. Our mean is 150, and our sigma is 5. <coughs> so this is z and this is x. Now what I can do is through some um, nasty calculus is determine how much um, 
percentile wise there is in each space. So what percent of a curve out of 100% is here? And what percent is here? So what we're doing is calculating the area under the curve. And this is called the 3414 rule. So if you remember, I, there's no mnemonic for that. If you come up with one, let me know. But 3414 rule. Well, there's approximately 34%. It's actually 34.13, but close enough. Between 0 and 1. So that means, since this is symmetric, hot dog folds 34% over here, 14%, and these little chunks. And why is it smaller? Because think the distribution is going down. So there's obviously less percent here. And then two out here on the end. So if you can remember 34, 14, 68 plus these 14, so there's only four left. Okay. <clears throat> so that adds up to 50 over here, 50 over here. The whole thing adds up to 100. So you can draw a lot of these. <clears throat> um, and even though we can get, one second, we can get R to tell us these percentages exactly, I always suggest drawing it um, because then you can know if you've typed your code correctly, somewhat, right? Yeah. But the, the danger in that is like if, like, I'm asking this because I have made this and I'm not, I realized it's wrong, but like if I had said I'm one and a half standard deviations above, that would not be saying I'm 41% higher because since it's curving down, like, because the 14% between the first and second standard deviation isn't 14% spread evenly in that group. Right, but if you're saying here I'm at one and a half. Yeah, it would. Yeah, it, this would be seven, this would be 34, so there's your 41%, but don't forget you still get this half. But wouldn't it be because like the 14 over that is slur, is like, is curved, wouldn't it not be just 7%? Because like. Mm, I see what you're saying. Um, No. Okay. <laughs> if you split it in half, it's still 7% on each side. Oh, that's You're weird. talking about exact point estimates. Oh, God, that's yeah. really weird. <laughs> um, we're, talking, we're talking about, you're kind of thinking of it as like my exact estimate here. Mm -hmm. That's not the way we're talking about this. We're talking about it as like a continuum. So if I stop at one and a half, there's 7% to one and then all the rest here. Okay. So we're talking about the cumulative all of okay. it together. That's yeah. going to talk with my brain though. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Point estimates are a different thing. We'll do those later. Yeah. Um, okay. Good. So what we could do is do is use a Z table, but my thoughts on Z tables are like this. Because I find them, students find them very confusing, um, especially the one in the book. There are no negatives on the Z table, but there are negatives on a chart, and it really confuses people, because why aren't there any negatives? I have that written down right here, why there aren't any negatives. So most distribution tables only show you positives because it's symmetric. Negatives and positives are the same thing. So if you have a question on the homework that says, why are there no negatives on a table? It's because it's symmetric. It's the same as the positive side. But that just really messes with people's brains. Okay. Um, so we're going to use R to calculate for us instead, because uh, I don't like to think hard. You guys don't like to think hard? Make the program think, do the thinking. Okay. <clears throat> Fortunately, it's really easy. Okay. Um, <clears throat> and then my fact to my always draw this. Okay. Uh, this is from the book, so it makes my table, because it's like, it's clear memory and memor minimizes errors. Yeah, whatever. Okay. It will help you make sure that you're kind of on the right track, though. So if I draw this out and I work like Caleb's example, we're at 1.5 and you tell me that the percent is 7%, I'm like 7% to what? There's this whole half of the distribution over here. So your 41% was right to zero. So you also have to have this other half. So it's actually 91% this way and 9% this way. You all see how bad I get math. Um, so it kind of, to me, it makes me help, helps me think of like what I should be typing in the code. Okay. I always draw them, even when people ask me questions, and I've taught this class for a long time. So, <clears throat> so let's try it. It's very simple things. Um, so we're going to try to get p-values. This is p-norm. Okay. So to get a p-value, you type p-norm. Yeah. It's somewhat easy. <laughs> P norm, because I want a p value out of the normal distribution. I'm going to type in z, 
And then this lower tail thing is the, not the hard part, but. The interesting part. <coughs> Oh, I can just type it here. <clears throat> or I could not type. That would be great. On this one, the if you want to use the computer, there's nothing to install. Uh, use the computer in front of you. There's no package for this one. This is beta. So you don't have to pull out your computer in the last couple minutes. So with PNORM, let's pick back on back to our example. Let's type in 1.5. Okay. <clears throat> Because we already figured out that that should be 91%. Now the lower tail part. So do lower dot tail equals. Your options are T for true or F for false. It has to be in caps or we'll be grumpy with you. Okay. Now which way do I want? Well, if the question is what's the percentile for this person? Okay. When they're talking about percentiles, they mean I want to know everything up to them. So I want to know... I picked 1.5 here. Everybody this way. So do you want the lower half? Yes or no? Just remembering this is the low end. Yes. yes. Okay. So we would type true for that one. That's 93%. Because these aren't perfect. So 93.32% are below 1.5. If I wanted the upper half, so quick uh, tip, if you hit the up arrow, it will retype the last thing that you typed. So I can just back up and hit false. I'm getting almost 7%. So I can uh, just not be spreading. Okay. Uh, so these two will add up to 100, because the whole distribution adds up to 100%. If you don't like um, proportions, you can do that times 100. If you're not good at the decimal thing. Um, so the lower tail if it's true or lower tail if it's false depends on which way you want to go. So if you say true, it's going to give you everything up to that point. So it's going to be the lower half. If you say false, it's going to give you that point and up. So it's like who are you better than and who are you worse, worse than. Mm -hmm. But the thing that gets confusing to people is the question sometimes will ask, what's the percentile rank? That one you want lower tail is true. So they want how many people are you above? That's why I always draw it. Uh, so let's see, if I did uh, negative 1.5. <laughs> what you're going to see, let me erase this. So if I do lower tail is false, let me put a negative in here. Okay. So if I'm at negative 1.5 and I do lower tail is false, that's going to give me this way. So it should give me 94%. Okay. And it does. And then if I do that 1.5, lower tail is true, it gives me 6%, because now we're going this way. And that's how it's symmetric. So 1.5 and 1.5 have the same numbers. It just depends on which direction we're going. Right? All right. <clears throat> what we'll do next time is talk about how do I get Z and then do a bunch of these examples with numbers that are harder to estimate.